Calvary. If you have your Bible, turn to Romans chapter 10, verse 10 this morning. I'm going to preach you, I guess you might say, an unusual message. This is for somebody who has never heard the Word of God and knows nothing about the New Testament. Amen. Nothing. You say, well, now, where is that? Some foreign country? No, that's right here on Woodrow Drive. Amen. For certain. Knoxville has plenty that, uh, that know nothing of the Scripture. In the book of Romans, chapter number 10, Romans 10, and verse number 10, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him, for whosoever, underline that, that's important, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Father, bless the book now. In thy name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. If you'll notice it doesn't say what you call. It says who you call to. Nobody has to put words in your mouth. Your relationship with God is the most private, personal thing that can happen to anybody. Amen. It's a very, very uh, inward thing as the believing heart. But I want to talk to you this morning about the New Testament. The New Testament is 27 books written 2,000 years ago. The New Testament is attested in secular history by Herod the Great, Caesar Augustus, and other names that are mentioned in it. There is no question that the New Testament is a valid book. If you get a, in the Babylonian Talmud, you'll find that the, uh, the, uh, the Jews were definitely conscious of the existence of the New Testament 2,000 years ago. And my friend, if you've never heard the gospel this morning, I'm going to try my best to break this down for you and explain to you why we are what we are. This New Testament of 27 books is about one man. One man. It mentions a lot of people, but every one of them have something to do as it relates to that one man. He is the object of the New Testament. That one man is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Any preaching that leaves out the Lord Jesus Christ, my dear friends, is more than likely uh, superficial. And it has no basis and no foundation to it. He's the object of the Bible. For he told them, he said, search the scriptures, friend them, you think you have eternal life, and they are they that testify of me. That's the Old Testament. The Jew calls it the Tanakh. And that is the word of God. So he is the object of the New Testament. These books were written over a period of time about 60 to 65 years. Somewhere in there. The last book of the New Testament was finished about 95 A.D. 95 A.D. That means that we're looking at a book, 27 of them, that's 2,000 years old. Israel at the time was occupied with the Roman Empire. This is why Caesar Augustus comes to play and why Pilate and others of the Roman Empire. Because it was occupied by a foreign power. When the Lord Jesus Christ was born, he was born under the reign of Augustus Caesar. Augustus Caesar's name was Octavian. He is the longest reigning Caesar of the empire. Over 40 years, this one man built that nation. And so he's mentioned in the scripture. There's no question you can trace Caesar Augustus in secular history. The Bible says he was born in Bethlehem of Judea. The prophet Micah says that that's where he would be born, chapter 5. Micah, chapter number 5. O Bethlehem, though thou be the small or little among those tribes of Judah, out of you shall he come forth. Even 2,000 years ago, the counselors of Herod knew that scripture. He was born in Bethlehem. But he was raised in Nazareth. Nazareth is on the edge of the valley of Megiddo. The Valley of Megiddo is where the, uh, the Battle of Armageddon will take place, according to the book of Revelation. That meant that as a boy, the Lord Jesus Christ could look down into that valley and see where the final confrontation would take place. At the age of 30, he began his ministry. At the age of 30, he came forth into public ministry. He read from the 61st chapter of Isaiah in the synagogue in Capernaum. 
And he read where the scripture says that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he hath anointed me to preach his word. And so Christ started. He called twelve disciples. These disciples were apostles. They became apostles. Because not only were they followers of Christ, they were endued with special power. That makes them apostles. He had a short ministry of only three and a half years or so. He wasn't here long. And the Apostle John said of what Christ did when he was here, that if all the things that he did were written down in books, this world couldn't hold them. Amen. Amen. So there's no doubt much that Christ did that we don't know about, but that's okay. I know more than I can handle now. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Better believe it. The Apostle John said this, and John is one of the twelve, one of the apostles, and he was in the inner circle Peter, James, and John were three that the Lord Jesus took with him to places he didn't take the others. They were with him on top of that mountain of transfiguration. They were with him at Gethsemane. They were, they were near to Christ because he had chosen them. The New Testament is comprised of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The book of Acts is part of the New Testament. It's the early history of the church. The Pauline epistles make up 13 or possibly 14 books of the New Testament if the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. He wrote, therefore, the big majority, the biggest majority of the books of the New Testament. One man, Saul of Tarsus. Then you have the general epistles like 1 Peter, like Hebrews, books like that. These are general epistles. They're not addressed not necessarily to a particular church, like the, like the Pauline epistles to the church at Galatia, to the church at Ephesus, to the church at Thessalonica, and so forth. The Pauline epistles are addressed to churches, but the general epistles are just simply addressed to the believers. And then the book of Revelation, which is the last book of the Bible. And don't let anybody flim-flam you. That is the last book of the Bible. It was written about 90, 95 A.D. on the reign of Domitian. The book of Revelation is the book that people like to play with. The book of Revelation is the book of prophecy, but it's not easy to understand it. The book of Revelation is the book that people send a lot of time reading and talking about prophecy. Be careful with that. The ministry of Christ, this New Testament records for us. The ministry, it tells you what he did. He preached the gospel. John chapter number 3 and verse 16, here's what he said. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He told that to Nicodemus. That's as simple that a child can understand that. That's very simple. Now he taught much more than that. And he taught about the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God and all of that. But to get down to the nitty gritty nuts and bolts, Christ came into this world to save sinners. And the Apostle Paul said, of whom I am chief. Understand that. The book of the New Testament is written to sinners. It's written to people that need a relationship with God. It is written to show you who God is. And it is written to lead you to the Lord. It is written to tell you what you're made out of. And it answers the questions that you may not have even thought to ask. That's the New Testament. He healed the sick. The woman with the issue of blood. He cast out devils. And the devils when they were coming out said, We know who thou art. Thou art the Holy One of God. Devils are smarter than most people. Amen. He raised the dead. A funeral procession was passing. And he walked up to the casket and he put his hand on it and said, I see unto you arise. And he raised the widow of Nain's son from the dead. He raised Lazarus from the dead. Come forth, he said. And the voice of the Son of God is the voice of power, salvation, deliverance. Everything we need is in the voice of the Son of God. If you'll just hear his voice, he can change your life today. Some of you have tried everything under the sun. You've tried counseling. You've tried 12-step programs, 20-step programs. You've tried this, that, this, that, this, that. But my dear friend, nothing can change you like the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Churches full of hundreds of thousands, yea, millions of people that were prostitutes, drug addicts, thieves, liars, murderers, everything, yet they've been changed by a power that is far greater than them if they believe that Bible. 
He raised the dead. I think he took pleasure in that. I think he said when Lazarus come forth, they all stood there and their teeth abated. They thought, what is going on? This man's nuts! And yet he came out of the dead. He came forth from the tomb. Loose him! Let him go! Amen! And off went the grave clothes. He has power to speak to that which cannot hear or respond. His voice is the voice of life. That's right. He gave Lazarus his life through his voice. And that today is the same thing that happened to any of us. If you'll listen to his words. Receive the word of God. The word has life in it. It is the living word. It will give you life. Hallelujah to God. Amen. He raised the dead. He fed thousands with five loaves and two small fishes. He walked on water. And then he spoke to the elements. Be still. <laughs> and even the wind obeyed him. The wind had no consciousness to obey anything. The wind is the wind. It is the power in his voice again. The one who said, let there be. And universes came into existence. Just took a little bit of his time and said, peace be still. And the wind ceased. And the sea ceased raging. And they were calm again. And he can do the same thing for your soul today. Amen. Amen. You might be in this house this morning and your soul is at war. I mean, there's been no peace in your heart for a long time. Sin is ravaging your soul. It will eat you alive. But he said, peace be still. He said, my peace I give unto them. Not as the world giveth, give I them my peace from the Prince of Peace. Peace that can look into the face of death and say as that lady did I told you the other day, you can't scare me with heaven. Amen. I know whom I have believed. Amen. Do you know who you believed? I believe the Bible. He fed thousands. He walked on water. He commanded the elements. And as John said, many other things. Now, my friend, he did many other things. They hated him. The Pharisees and the religious leaders and, and, the, and, the, and those who were in control, who were, who were over the overlords of Israel's religion at that time, they despised him. They saw him as an interloper. They saw him as someone who was a troublemaker. He, he, he stirred up the problems with Rome. They wanted the peace of Rome, not the peace of God. They wanted Rome's peace. And so therefore they'd do anything they, to, they had to to appease Rome. There's a big difference between Caesar's peace and the peace of God. Amen? Amen. Better believe it. Big difference between the two. I watched the Queen of England. And I watched a lot of that funeral. And I really felt sorry for that lady when she stood up and she walked out of that cathedral. And she had her back to the camera and she was walking alone for the first time in 73 years. Her husband had been right by her side. They had an exemplary marriage. They had the kind of marriage where they loved each other. She was just a, a, a young girl when she fell in love with him. And he was right there with her for all that time. He was an army, a uh, naval, I think he was a naval officer. And he was a, a World War II hero. He was a man. He was a man. Now you may not, you may have a lot of things about the monarch, monarchy of England you may not like. But let me tell you something. Uh, prime minister after prime minister after prime minister came and went. But the Queen of England stayed where she was. In plain words, she gave Great Britain a foundation that changed not. She was there solidly year after year. Look at this country. Look at it. All of a sudden, everything's turned upside down, completely changed, and now what's happening? Think about it. Think about every four years you may have to deal with a complete upheaval and change. That's nothing. There's no steadfastness in that. There's no consistency in that. We need a new system. Amen. Amen. So the uh, Pharisees hated him. And because of that, they turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. Crucifixion is what you see on the cross. A crucifix is where you see a cross and there's somebody on that cross. That's a crucifix. Without them on the cross, it's just a cross. A lot of you may have crosses on today. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with the cross. It just reminds you of who went to that cross and died for you. Amen. And he did. But it was a horrible death. He didn't understand what that cross is about. It is a message from God. It is God saying to you, I love you. I love you. 
He didn't say, I love a murderer. He didn't say, I love a thief. He didn't say, I, lo I love all that. He said, I love you. Amen. In other words, it doesn't make any difference what you've done. He died for the sinner on the cross. He bore the sinner's hell on the cross. He bore the sinner's damnation on the cross. He bore the wrath of God on the cross. What more could He bear? What greater lesson could He give any of us than to show us on the cross how much He loved us? Has been said before. How much does He love us, preacher? That much. That much. Anybody. Red, yellow, black, and white. Races are, is, is irrelevant. Your money in the bank, your standing in, in lie, your, your, your whatever your ass says, who, all the accolades have been piled on your head means nothing. At the foot of the cross, He sees only sinners. Amen. Sinners that can be saved. So they turned Him over to be crucified. He didn't fight it. He said, for this cause came I into the world. You need to hear that. He wasn't a martyr. He wasn't fighting something. And when Peter said, not so, Lord, you're not going to the cross. It's not going to happen. He said, get thee hence, Satan. You, see, you seek the things of man and not of God. And of course, Peter was innocent in his heart. His motive was good. You know, don't be so hard on Peter. I probably said the same thing myself. The Lord Jesus followed a higher call. Listen to a higher voice. He had a reason for coming into this world. He said, for this cause came I here. As some of the old time preachers used to say, he had the vision of the cross before him at every moment of life, every breath he ever breathed. He could see the cross. That's why he came. For an old, sorry, low-down piece of garbage like me that deserves hell a thousand times over. I'm telling you right now, dear friend, I did everything that a person could do to go to hell. I deserved it. I'll be in hell now. I'm, I, I had no hope. Lost as lost can be. Yet a voice spoke to my soul. And he drew me to the cross. Amen. If your religion has no cross in it, all you have is religion. If your Christian religion has no blood on that cross, all you got is religion. If your Christian religion has no sacrifice, vicarious suffering of the death of Christ on the cross, all you got is a bunch of man-made garbage. Amen. There's one cross, and that's his cross. And he'll bear that cross, and did. For three days his body lay in the tomb. Three days. Three days. His body lay in the tomb. He didn't lay in the tomb. But his body lay in the tomb. On the third day, according to the scriptures, he told him, he said, in three days I'll raise it up. And he did. On the third day he came forth from the dead. That one that had died on the cross, that had given himself for us, who loved us. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That one three days later came forth. All hell couldn't hold him. Every demon power couldn't hold him. Nothing could hold him. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? It's been swallowed up in life. Amen. Up from the ground he arose with a mighty victor over his foes. Amen. And he came forth. What a thing. Death he defeated. You've all had part of it. I was talking about the Queen of England. God bless her soul. I've prayed for it. I've prayed for the monarchy. And it touched my heart because I've seen this before. I've seen widows. I've seen widowers. I've seen people lay their bodies of their little babies out there in the graveyard. I've been there, folks. Been there. Been there. I've been around death for 44 years. Been around it. Been around it. A lot. And I'm so glad, thank God, that that's not the end. That's not the end. He arose. Hallelujah, He arose. And so if you don't believe that, then you're part of religion. But you don't know the Lord. That is one of the foundational doctrines of the Lord, is that He was virgin born, that He died on the cross for our sins, was buried, and on the third day He came forth from the dead. Then the Bible says He ascended to the right hand of the Father, the earth, up he went. They stood and they watched him go up. I'm sure they had a lot to say about that. How many is on the Mount of Olives? And here they are, the Kidron Valley's below them, the eastern gates behind them. And they look up there and they see him rise, ascend. And then the angel said, Why stand you here gazing? Well, I'll tell you what, right now, son, <laughs> I'd be doing some gazing, believe me. That angel said, What do you stand here gazing? The same Jesus which is taken up from you. Will so come again Amen. in like manner. 
You see, that's the great hope of the Christian. That is. That's the great hope of the Christian. He said, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. From my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. I will come again. Hallelujah. I'll come again. Amen. To receive into myself that where I am there, you may be also. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest, and how can he know the way? I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. That was good 2,000 years ago. That's good in 2021. No man, neither is our salvation in any other, Peter said. For there is only one name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. The name of the only Savior there is. The only door to heaven. The only blood covenant. The only sacrifice for your soul is the Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, that's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. And he ascended. We minister that. The right hand of the Father as he promised he'll come again. Maybe today. We'll go out and get ready to go eat and sit down at the table there and pick up our knife and our fork and... <coughs> well, I thought I served them. There's their pizza. Where'd they go? <laughs> They're gone, son. They're gone. Get in the bus, take off down the road, and everybody's in that bus talking this and that. First thing you... Where's the driver? <laughs> You're at 35,000 feet. Lord have mercy help us. <laughs> You're at 35,000 feet, pilot got you on, you know, you're flying, you're flying the, the, the highway in the air, they call it, according to the exact standard, and here you are at 35,000 feet, and everything just fine, steward is coming back there, you're getting this, getting that, and then the stewardess comes to the door, and her face is as pale as it can be, and she looks back and says, where's the pilot? Amen. It's going to happen like that. Kids come to church, you got mom and dad, oh, you had a good morning, talk good and love each other. Mom and dad are Christians, and you're a rebel. And you sit down, and all of a sudden, where's mom and dad? That's when it'll hit you. He's coming again. Amen. That's called the rapture. He's coming again. I'm glad he's coming again. Because the Republican Party's not going to help you. The Democrat Party's not going to help you. The Whigs aren't going to help you. Whoever's not going to help you. That's not going to come from, from politics. I get so fed up with both sides of them. I really do. Lying dogs, there's not the most backstabbing crowd that ever lived is, poli is, is, is politician. It is. They're not going to help you. Your salvation cometh from the Lord. Amen. 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 I like it in Israel. I really do, man. Netanyahu right now is over there trying to form a coalition government. The president of Israel has said to him, form a coalition government. What does that mean? That means that he, I don't have big it, it needs to be, but something like 20, 30 people make up his, his government and they all have a voice in it. And so the change from one to another is not so drastic because more people have a voice in what's going on. Amen. They call it the Knesset, the ruling body. But I guess old, good old America, I mean, maybe one day we'll learn we need more than two political parties. If I had anything to do, we'd have 20. I would. Amen. You'll have a new life and a home in heaven. The Bible ends by this. This is beautiful. Turn to Revelation. Chapter 22. Revelation 22. This is John now, folks. This is the Apostle John. Same one who wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. Same one, one who wrote the Gospel of John. This is John the Apostle. Verse 1, chapter 22, Revelation. He showed me a pure river of the water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God. Now the Lamb, I want you to underline the word pure. Everything in heaven is pure. Clean. No corruption. You'll, you'll know every bit of death and corruption you'll ever know right here. There's none there. You'll know everything you'll ever know about separation right here. There's none there. You can hunt all over that place and you'll never find the first graveyard. It's not there. Now, I love my nurses and doctors. God bless them. We appreciate them. But there will be no hospitals in heaven. Won't be there. But the lamb will be there. And the father will be there. And it's a pure. Now look at verse number 12. 
And he said, I come quickly and my reward is with me. To give every man according to his work shall be. I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning, the end, the first, the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Now, verse 17, this is the one. Look at this carefully. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst come. And I like this. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Hallelujah. Notice that? Whosoever will. The Bible is anti-sectarian. It is anti-ethnicity. It is anti-autocrats oh, and the rest of them and this and that. The Bible is written to you where you are, exactly as you are, and it tells you to come and he'll save your soul. Would you do it today? Would you come? This might be the first time you've ever heard it. And I'll play this on the radio. The thing's going out there. It may be for some people out there that have never heard the word of God. I tried my dead level best in this message this morning to not make it about Baptist or about Methodist or about Presbyterian or Catholic or Church of God, Church of Christ or whatever. I wanted to make it about the Son of God Amen. because he's everything. Father, bless your word now. In thy name I pray. Amen.